Well, hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to another installment of Show to Be with Mike G, the show of life, the show of New York, the show of loving Britain, loving Jake Tapper and whiskey. Today's guest is the amazing Karen Igalka of Compass Box Whiskey. I want to take a moment here to say that the past few months have been very trying, very difficult, and extremely dark for me. You'll hear more about that as I think it unfolds in some of the upcoming interviews. But Karen has been a great friend, and she has been very supportive, and she's always there on the road and willing to listen to my absolute rubbish and my turmoil. But this was the first interview. She has an amazingly decorated career in the spirits industry, and this is the first. We sip some lovely whiskey during San Antonio Cocktail Conference, and we get to know each other. Fellow Aquarians forever, thank you so much, Karen. So without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this great chat with Karen Igalka of Compass Box Whiskey. I'm really, I'm a big Jake Tapper fan. Do you know who Jake just, Tapper is? No, on I'm going to be honest. No, which, C- which he's show like is this, he? He's, he's like... Jake Tapper, the lead. He's like the he's the like prime time lead guy, the head guy on CNN. Really? Yeah. He outranks Cooper. Anderson I Cooper? mean, they're probably they're probably neck and neck. Okay. Now, Does he have gray hair as well? He does not. He's like like salt and peppery. Oh, he's that's very handsome good. though. Yeah. He's very handsome. I, I got I saw the, the look like in your eyes. You got, the, kind of you got the, a little you know, bit. You know you know the the like hearts <laughs> the, where it's like that emoji that the hearts I get the like same pop. Look. I know yeah. it's the same one. Yeah. There was a sparkle. I know you guys can't see glimmer. the sparkle. Yeah. But Basically, this, I want on on air to, to be like, oh, Karen Agalka, Jake Tapper. Like, I wanted to <laughs> somehow with someone somewhere is going to Google Jake Tapper and my name's going to come up. What if you guys were in the same room and having a drink together? Um, I'd, I'd be, I would probably fall all over myself with excitement. Would you be but all right I would with look, it? But I would look, you know, this, much like I look right now. Right, which is always calm. It. Yeah. Just, no matter what. Yeah, I mean, I always describe myself. There's this owl that um, one of its defensive features is that it can like, it can f- it can like puff all of its feathers out and uh-huh. make itself look really scary, um, and I'm like this owl. I'll show you the I'll show you the like the the gif in a minute. How do um, you transform into said it's owl? It's like basically it's just like I'll look like you know 95 percent of the time I'm just like this, and then sometimes something will happen. I'll be like, in just like no time. It's just kind of instant. instant. I almost got the tension in the room just right? from that brief look. Wow. Yeah, it just felt really cold. Right? Well, if I can do anything to repay you for taking the time out to chat with me, oh. it will be to arrange. <laughs> Some kind, because you know, whiskey is the best conduit to a conversation. Right. One right. of them, anyway. Yeah, I mean. I think maybe we can do something. My friend works at CNN. Really? Yeah. Mm, let's so, make this happen. Watch out. I, I think we can make this happen. I think so. I'll, I'll try. All right. Really, well, I'm not. This is not an empty promise. I mean that. So this story, however, uh-huh. is an interesting. Cause the thing to me is, it feels like you're this balance of left and right brain. You've got this yes. computer science thing you're talking about for yes. the recording, really like the numbers. Yeah. But then, art. So stuff. yeah, I mean, I was I was always like a really numbers girl, like kind of math science, super yeah. super left brain, I guess it is. Um, but binary, you know, black and white, all of that stuff. Um, I thought I was going to be a chemistry major going to college, you know, all this stuff. And this is all in Massachusetts, yeah. Yeah, I'm from Massachusetts. I'm from about half hour outside of Boston, a town called Framingham. And um, yeah, I was always just a numbers girl. Um, and then we had to take at Dartmouth, we had to take like these introductory courses. These like um, the they're kind of like the broad, broad survey courses. You have to right. take the different requirements. And so I took Art History 1. And it was just this language I didn't understand for a second and couldn't, you know, couldn't get my head around it, but was really turned on by it. Like, really loved everything about, about you know, being able to figure out uh, styles of art by their, by their brush strokes, by their shading, by the iconography. Yeah. Some, it just was fascinating to me of trying to... A- any particular artist resonate with you more than others? Um, I always was a really... I was a big fan of Magritte, which is... Um, I love Magritte, that is, bull and... 
Yeah, which is, um, I mean, which was much later in, in studying art that I kind of uh, discovered him. But it's so funny because working for Compass Box, we did This Is Not a Luxury Whiskey, which Cicine is a big, pop, yeah. yeah, which is a big, it's a riff off of Sissy Name Pop and Peep. So um, we, it's, Full it's circle. yeah, it's resonated a lot with me. Um, so I, I really liked, um, I liked that whole period. I thought the Surrealist movement was pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, but just stuff that I could figure out. Honestly, stuff that was that was um, abstract expressionism really troubled me because being a math sciencey person, I couldn't, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. So it was something I really wanted to figure out a way to, you know, figure out the formulas that could crack me understanding this. So thinking about the antithesis of an actual easy thing to understand, like yeah. Rothko to me, and then I'm not. Yeah, again, I love Rothko. Yeah. Easy, right? Yeah. Just a simple structure against another simple structure. You would think. You would think. You would Barnett think. Newman, even. Yeah, more Barnett Newman, the zips. Yeah, everything. Dude, just probably uh, really easy. You it. can just dive into it. Okay, so okay. the antithesis. What about Kandinsky or yep. Pollock? I mean, can you get into that because it's so. Oh, frenetic? I love. Well, uh, Kandinsky, I loved because he's a synesthete. So synesthesia is basically when you you feel colors oh, right, and you hear right, colors, yeah. like you kind of your senses get all muddled. Yeah. And I was fascinated by that. So actually, d I studied Kandinsky a whole bunch, um, just because of that. I thought it was just fascinating. The uh -huh. like kind of transfer between the senses and so that was something again like I could I could decode it I could decode what he was doing it was abstract expressionism was tough for me because you know Rothko you know I why did I feel this way was it right. because of this color is it because of the swaths of color was it because of the pressure behind the brush strokes stuff like that was just really fascinating to me it's an amazing thing the way that I was able to um to kind of find my footing in a world like art history was was through computer science so computer science was super easy for me. Um, it was, you know, because it was, again, programming. So uh, something off, that was right? on and off. Yep. Zero, one, one, zero, black and white. Like, I, my code was prettier than everybody else's code. Like, <laughs> a, you know, OCD in all the right ways for that. Um, and, you know, one of, the, one of the professors that I was working with um, in the computer science department was actually doing fraud detection, like helping create algorithms that could detect the different depths of brush strokes on paintings. What? And that's what I worked with him on. Oh my god. So it was how it was kind of like the union between um, between art and art history and valuation and commodification of art and computer science. I love those intersections. Yeah. Right? So that was what really did it for me. That's incredible. When, yeah. so this inclination you, you know self proclaimed math yeah, number math oriented. Yeah. yeah. Which is great, right? I don't know that I am, so this is nice because we'll yeah. have a very complete conversation. Right. Probably. But when you talk about maybe what your folks did, were they in similar kind of industries that you followed in those footsteps? Or? Uh, no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my older brother, who lives here in San Antonio. Oh, is no kidding. A, yeah. Oh, that's right, yeah. He's a neonatologist. So he fixes tiny babies, and then I get them drunk. No, <laughs> I sell whiskey and he fixes tiny babies. Um, that's the spectrum. Hey, right you know, there. that's the spectrum. We say, the we say it's like the circle of life. Like, yes. you know, I, you know I, I feed people whiskey. They go home. They make some decisions. They cry they're too pregnant. sometimes. No, they're pregnant. They have, the, they have the baby. The baby's maybe sick. My brother saves the baby. Then they go out and drink whiskey to celebrate. So it's the circle of life, you know. So basically, you guys run yeah. a racket. Yeah, we are, we are the racket. Okay, it's got the Agalka it. racket. It yeah. makes more sense. Yeah, yeah. You have cracked it. <laughs> You've cracked the racket. <laughs> Vertical integration. Um, but yeah, it's a vertical. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> um, and so yeah, I my my dad's uh, my dad's big and uh, an owned investment management company. So he's um, big in finance. Um, uh, my mom uh, is a chef and a jeweler. No kidding. So yeah, no, does it, it's kind of the art thing was always just. Me. But that but to me, it sounds like you're actually kind of a pretty good blend of both. Yeah, right? yeah, the numbers exactly. And the numbers and like the artistic creation, using your hands and yeah. using your mind and flavors and all Maybe. that. Um, yeah, the it's kind of. But no pressure to go in one way or the no, other. They're like no. kind of do. I was you. I was gonna be a lawyer until you know until I actually discovered this program that was done through Sotheby's, um, the uh, the auction house people. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So um, my senior year in college, I was taking the LSATs, or was a junior year in college, I was taking the, the LSATs and studying for all that because I thought I was gonna go be like an art lawyer or something like that. Wow. Um, you know, somebody who was doing IP that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, and uh, my um friend of mine that was in the art history department with me said hey oh there's a, there's this new Sotheby's program in um in London it's like a pilot program they're taking like 10 oh. students globally um for a master's of art in art business and I interviewed and came down to New York and did all the things and applied and didn't really tell anybody and got in moved to London 
Favorite city in the world. Favorite city in the world. Easily. Easily. What do you like about London? Oh my God, I'm an Anglophile through and through. I lived there. I, I actually I lived there. I got my master's there. Um, it took about two years, and then or it took about a year and a half, and then I actually signed up for. Um, English as a second language business school classes so I could extend my visa and stay there longer. It's amazing. <laughs> so uh, I love, I, I, if we bond on this point, I may have to end the interview because I've just met like just this crazy <laughs> split thing. It's like the other side of my personality. All right. Yeah. Love London. I was always wondering why. Right now I've got an interesting backstory in terms of well, maybe I actually am English and I didn't oh, realize. Really? Yeah, shit like that. That's cool. Really strange. And yeah, anyway, we'll talk about it later. But the music. Oh, God. Manchester. Oh, my goodness. Brighton. Oh, my goodness. London. Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. Oh, I'm getting favorite chills. band of all times. <laughs> I have the haircut, too. So if you, don't, yeah, you can't yeah, see me, yeah, I kind of got this, this Noel know, thing going it. on. Yep. But, so beyond Oasis, what are a few other bands that really helped you just dive into wanting to go? To well, that, well, that's not why I went to London. But no, I mean, of like, course not. But also, not. like, the hurt, Beatles. Though. Beatles, I mean, yeah. obviously, I was a huge Beatles fan. Same my haircut. stepfather is, like, gave me, bought me every, for my bat mitzvah when I was 13, yeah. bought me every Beatles album that was ever, oh, ever made. Man. So, um, yeah, I mean, always from, from a young age. Stones a little bit. Um, uh, I mean... London Calling is probably one of my favorite songs. Yeah, the, class getting, the class beautiful. is just amazing. Um, but even like up to Blur, Oasis, um, all those guys, uh, Baby Shambles. Yes. I mean, like Libertines, that kind he of. Keith Doherty, man. Yeah, he's, he's a I mess, mean, but he's good. I don't. He's just the the he's the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, yeah, Doherty. I don't know how he's alive. Like That's I don't right. know, Like I I was I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and I said. Um, I said, how is this guy still alive and, like, all these other people have died? Like, right. I mean, ha- this guy, like, basically, his f- five favorite food groups are, like, heroin, 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 and, heroin, and, 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 and meth. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I just, the, everything, and for me, also, the museums in London, you know, oh, everything's see. free, you can walk in any time. Yeah. The drinking culture is a little bit different. I just, there's something about, about just the, the timbre of London that, 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 that uh, puts me to life. It's funny, every, every time I go there, I go there about four times a year. Oh, amazing. Um, because uh, all my best friends live there. Because um, I live there for quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, my company there is now based. Compass Box is based in London. This this is turning out to be a great career move, isn't it? Oh yeah. Oh, I mean, Jeez. hey, I've got the master. The master plan is ends in London. <laughs> I t- yes, this is good. We're gonna talk about this. Yeah, there we plan. go. The master plan. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just kind of like where my heart beats. So yeah, moved to London, studied art. Um, Decided I didn't really want to be in the art business anymore. What was there? Was there you know, a certain? It's something that I'm so passionate about. You know, like I go into I go into the Rothko room at the Tate, for example, yeah. and I sit in the Rothko room for like, you know, two hours just by myself. You know, just I find art to be a very personal thing. And um, the thing I have found when I studied it more at Sotheby's and with those guys, it's a great program, but it just really commodified everything, yeah. which obviously, I mean, it's Sotheby's, it commodifies everything. Have to, yeah. But it just kind of was a little heartbreaking and not really, wasn't really, didn't really tick my buttons like that, push my buttons. In it's the a right strange thing. I played music for a long, long time. Yeah. And then when you realize that you have to have the sound, you have to have the look. And even yeah. if the songs are good, yeah. it doesn't really matter. Yeah, exactly. I'm not young enough anymore. <laughs> you know, like I'm a little too gray. <laughs> and it's just these kinds of, well, in some places, I suppose. But <laughs> <laughs> but it is a strange thing where you come yeah. into this cross- crossroads and you're like, I was pursuing this. This was a love. Yeah. And then you realize you see it in a different light someday. Well, yeah, for me, it was like I didn't want to lose the... The, I didn't want to lose the love that I had. I mean, there were so many writers that were being lauded for being, oh, you know, this is about about how art is almost like inaccessible. And my whole thing was always to make things as accessible as possible for yeah. people. Um, and you know, I loved when I loved when I could take somebody into a museum and say, like, look at this, and this is why it looks like this, and this is why he painted it this way, and kind of crack the code for them the way yeah. that I was able to crack the code on paintings when I was studying. And that's kind of what turned me on to it. And there's so many art scholars. Um, Maybe not now, now anymore because uh, again, I don't really follow it as deeply as I did. But when I was kind of in academia about it, um, that they were trying to almost trying to make it as inaccessible as possible, and saying like, no, it's not just a blue Eve Klein blue square. Oh, it, it has so much more to it, and blah blah blah. And it's just kind of like not letting people appreciate it because the less that people understood it, the more they'd pay for it. This kind of weird train of thought in that. It's regard. the same thing in the corporate world. Yeah. If you, if you siphon off all the data and don't let anybody understand what your talent is, yes. they're like, oh, well, I have to go to him to do it. Exactly. Job exactly. Security. Or so Nail people think. You nailed it. But yep. that's not that's not good. 
I information should be free. You should right, yeah. bring people into it. That's and actually it has a lot to do with Compass Box because Compass Box we're all about transparency. We're all about, you know, telling people exactly what's in the bottle, telling yeah. people, you know, what what whiskeys we use and why and how old and there's a lot of kind of stodgy old uh, scotch guys that want to keep us from from sharing everything, so. Well, that kind of attitude really resonates right now. People want to yeah. connect with stories and products, but not brands. Yeah, or, exactly. It's, it's, they want to go their own way with it. Exactly. And the more you're like, okay, well, we're doing this thing, you guys, as, as Lemmy said, and I've said this quote too many times, <laughs> raise your flag and see who salutes it. Yep, Right, exactly. that's it, so just do your fucking thing and then yeah. people will come or they won't. Or they won't. It. Yeah, and it's and okay if they don't. And that's the thing is that we, you know, we are, we are, I don't want to say we're the pioneers of that because there's a lot of other people doing it as well, but um, but we're really putting our foot down when it comes to, you know, like, for example, our whiskey that's called Three-Year-Old Deluxe. Yeah. I mean, there's this whole rule that you can only tell the age of the youngest whiskey in the blend. All right, well, uh, we want to tell people that there's 27-year-old whiskey or there's 30-year-old whiskey or right. whoever else is in there, but we're only, we put like a drop of three-year-old whiskey into this blend just so that it could be like the world's most expensive three-year-old whiskey. You know, and that's the kind of it, exactly. And that, <laughs> that's so much of what we do is cheeky, and it kind of, um, it kind of brings to the forefront the you know the whole notion of is more information better? Is yeah. more of a, why are they? Why are what is there to hide? Why shouldn't we be able to say what we want to say and stuff like I, that? I I like that a lot, and we'll talk about that rebellious nature here in a moment. <laughs> but why did you leave London? Oh well, my visa ran out. So you. You fall out of love in a little bit with the industry. In a oh, with art. Yeah. 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 But, and then so you're left probably at a crossroads where you could get a job potentially, well, right? No. Well, so basically what happened was I had told my father like a long time ago, if I wasn't going to stick it out in the art world, I would come back. I'd come back to Roost uh, and I'd go into finance. And that was kind of his, the, uh, the, the agreement, the agree, the negotiation. Uh, I see. Okay. Um, it go. didn't stop me from having $70,000 worth of student loans, but I did agree. Not to much it. does. Yeah, no, not, not much. Is, it's funny how that <laughs> hey, number just doesn't, that, too. that number great, didn't, yeah. that number has not been declining as much as I thought it would be. No, and I'm like, I've been paying so much every month. How do I still owe this much money? You don't flinch anymore either, do you? No, just I just, like, just eh, eh, pay, eh. auto pay, oh, you know, it is I hate what it, it is. It's so education, but at least we're really lovely to be around. Yeah. That's what that degree You know did, what? Exactly. Right. It's, 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 she's got a great smile. <laughs> she's got a ton of student debt. A ton of debt. No one can tell. A big, I big got this veneer. No one can see behind that. It's perfect. I'm freaking out. So um, you did go into finance? So now? yeah, I moved home um, with a guy I was dating at the time. Um, and he actually, I was going to move back to Boston. And it's an English guy I was dating. And he said, um, I'll tell you what, Karen, if you move back to New York, if you move to the US and you move to New York, I'll come with you. If you go to Boston, I'm not coming with you. What, what, why that negotiation? Well, because he was just like, New York is the center of the, of the universe. Oh, okay, and I, I want to live in New York and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, I was, I'm from Boston. So I was always kind of anti-New York. But I said, all right, you know what, fine, I'll, I'll do it. So uh, so moved to New York, um, and I uh, got a job doing portfolio analytics for a small um, financial software research program called hmm. FactSet. It's kind of like a competitor of Bloomberg. Yep, okay. Yeah, so they're just kind of basically doing portfolio analytics for big companies, you know, making PowerPoint presentations. Even though, even though your eyes just raised, I'm not real sure you were totally stoked on it. The what? Was it, was it like a, was it a really know, riveting job? Well, or? no. Here's the here's the thing: is that it was um, it was fun for me in a couple of ways. Like I was like, all right, I can fit into this this rubric. You know, yeah. I can fit into this little. You know, I've always been kind of ant antithetical. Like I have um, I have half my head shaved, so you know you can. It's <laughs> you the can, good half, though, right? It's the good half, right? <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I've always been kind of a little bit, you know, against the against the grain, if you will. Um, but I kind of it was it was good for me to realize that I could fit into this corporate structure if I wanted to. Mm. Um, I'd get in there every day at like quarter to eight, put my headphones on, and just basically be me with a computer all day long. So that was um, easy and fed into my um, fed into kind of my natural talents. Um, and yeah, I found myself. It was me being a a, a woman in a in a group of um, in a like conference room with like 25 men all you know looking at me to tell them what's in their portfolios does it phase I mean obviously this is a big issue we won't get into too much but did that phase you at all or is it just like nah just another day doing my thing no it's just you know it's it's kind of I um, I don't anymore but I used to look very very young for my age um, and so you know people would say who's this self deprecation I love that that's really <laughs> no, good no it's not meant to be self deprecating or not it used to be a hindrance like I you know 
Um, but uh, now I'm kind of like, that would be great if that, that happened again. Can that happen? Can, can I Benjamin Button my way into that? You don't um, want it. You get smaller. It's really, right, I tried no. it. It's yeah, actually, that's probably not the right move. <laughs> um, but no, it was great, you know, to go in and have people be like, this girl, come on. And then, and then be like, yeah, actually, this is why, you're, this is why your fund is failing. X, Y, Z, blah, 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 blah. And then, oh, wow. Are you some sort of savant or something? No, I'm just good at my job. Just leave me alone, you know? Shit. Um, but so what happened was I just, I really didn't fit into the whole nine to five thing. And yeah. a lot of people that are in this industry now, um, my background, not my background, a lot of people that are in this side of the business will say the same thing. Nine to five thing just did not, did not work for me. And I found myself, you know, getting kind of pressured to go into happy hours with these people and drink Jaeger bombs and do the whole kind of growing out thing. Yeah. That, um, wasn't really my cup of tea. Um, and what, so what is it for you? What does that feel like? Is it that you need to shake the structure or is it that oh, you need to do this actually that, that sounded much heavier than I actually intended it to be. When I say that, it was just that um, uh, what you do or what one does when you work in one of these is you all bond together by going out drinking at yeah. 530. And I just, I just didn't like that, that social aspect of it. Got it. You know, I just, first of all, I didn't really like drinking during the week. It just wasn't, I, it's because I'd come from being a bar, ooh, sorry. Oh, you're good. Um, Tap I, that, you can hit the microphone all you want. One of the things that I failed to mention is that while I was in London, I started bartending. Uh. That was a big thing. So I was bartending at this like tiny little fancy cocktail bar in Notting Hill called Mook. And it was just so that I could, you know, earn some money because well, I was obviously spending pounds and earning, you know, and like right. coming from dollars. And so I was working and they hired me because I knew how to make coffee. I mean, it wasn't had anything to do with any bartending skills, but it was like my first exposure to kind of fancy cocktails. And um, yeah, I was making, you know, like 500 mojitos a day, that kind of thing. Do, so. you, li- do you like that? Thing. Well, because I guess it's binary too, right? Yeah, it was a, recipes. A bill, it was easy. Yeah. yeah, it was. But uh, it was unlike anything because, again, I had come from Boston to Dartmouth in New Hampshire to London. So this was my first taste of like cocktail culture. Yeah. And it's cocktail culture in 2004. So it was all like pink drinks and mojitos and things that before it even hit really here, right. you know. Um, and so when I moved back to New York or when I moved back to the States in New York, um, I, you know, I missed that kind of camaraderie. And so what I did instead of going out and going to happy hour with all these people and drinking Red Bulls and Jägermeister was um, a good friend of mine uh, introduced me to Jim Meehan, who ah, was running PDT, PDT right? and I was one of their opening staff there. Really? Yeah, so I was working, um, I worked for Jim and I just did it like kind of twice a week, started out waitressing um, and just after, after work, I would go um, directly from midtown from like right by grand central um i would change into more appropriate clothes for bartending (laughs) um come down to the east village and just like have a have a laugh like these were my people i mean just kind of much much better group like you kind of clicked i just i just was never somebody that looked normal in a suit so i mean you can understand yeah i can understand that yeah and um so yeah and that and then i would kind of bang away over there until three in the morning close the bar and then uh be right back at it seven in the morning uh back in midtown so my um, my stepmother, I would joke with her. Um, I would tell her about how I would go sleep on the floor of the bathrooms during lunch break because I was, you know, getting I was drinking, getting yeah. no sleep, and all this stuff. And and she was like, "Okay, now that they call you tile face, because I had these like <laughs> tiles." She's like, "I think it's time for you to make some serious career decisions." <laughs> TF for Ob- sure. Yeah, Just exactly. <laughs> obviously, everything is not. Obviously, you're not doing what you want to do if yeah. you are sleeping in the bathroom during the day. So. Um, so yeah, that's how that's how this whole kind of thing came to a head. Was I um, was moonlighting at PDT, and um, one of the regulars and one of our bartenders' friends happened to work for Moet Hennessy at the time, yeah. and came in and um, kind of offered me this job that was like a hybrid of the things I like to do, like the managing a budget and running the back end and being the in-house mixologist and running kind of the accounts for New York, the mixology accounts for New York. And at the time, there was no position like that um, on the sales side. It wasn't a brand ambassador or anything like that. This was like strictly numbers-based. Yeah. Um, and so she was like, listen, I want to create, um, I want to create a new role on my team um, to be like the mixology portfolio manager. And she's like, you'd have to quit both of your other jobs. I'm like, that's cool. Let's Deal? do that. Yeah. yeah. And it just happened to be that my first day with Moet Hennessy was April 1st, 2008. Is that and the bad that was financial? right before the <laughs> <laughs> so, so I like to say that, you know, I, I, you know, me leaving facts that is what caused the, the big financial meltdown. Well, I would right. say. Obviously. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, that's a pretty like, a logical. It's not like a large leap. I mean, what, it's just like a hop. Ad hoc 
fallacy? Is that what it is? That something happens just because something else happens and you try to link the two? Right, I'm just going to... Exactly. I think it's that. I think it's that. No, no, I mean that you really did do it. I think it's all... You have so much gravitas. It's like the um, the butterfly effect. That's right. Right, that's that's what it is. (laughs) I'm a butterfly. So, you know, I'm... So yeah, so that's what my that everyone's always like. How did you get into this side of the business? And I'm like, well, the short story is that you know I hated I hated being in an office. But well, so here's an interesting question. I, I I try to empathize and think. Well, if I was no judgment whatsoever, I've done it. If I was at the office sleeping on the bathroom <laughs> floor, luckily I've got a beard to cover up some of it, right? It was the handicap bathroom too. Like I had a lot oh, of good room. Space. Yeah, I had yeah. a lot of room. I mean, it could turn into a Kirby enthusiasm thing, but yeah, we, no. we were no, no, there. no. But were, did did you have a problem with that? Or you're like, eh, whatever, whatever. I didn't, you know, when you're kind of inside it, you don't, uh, when you're inside it, I kind of was like, this is my this is my new normal. My yeah. new normal is that I go and I get to kind of hang out with cool people at night on Wednesdays and Saturdays and, um, you know, maybe maybe mo- pick up Mondays and Thursdays and all that stuff. And, and during the, this is my day job. My day job, I come in and I, you know, grind away on a computer all day. So, you know, that was until, you know, somebody that cared about me very much was like, listen, this is actually not, this is no, no bueno. <laughs> like, I, I like it because you can just like, you're doing such a good, you, I, mean, I, I don't want to use the word spot, but like you're doing a good job. <laughs> you're helping these guys make a lot of money and like, I'm going to take some liberties. Yeah. I'm you know? sorry, well, but I'm going to in the bathroom. It was funny because, you know, I'd come out, I'd come out and like, go, I'd, like have my like Dartmouth hoodie on and my big headphones would be like painting my nails at my desk, but I'd still be doing really good work. So nobody could really fuck with me. You See, know? I love it. One thing that I've read recently yeah. about Aquarians. Yes. We can find the critical path to success in about 50 to 8. I'm quantifying this. It's yeah, total rubbish right. numbers. But I, lo- I, I like black and white. I'm binary. Numbers so, are good. So let's say there's a, we can do it 80% quicker. <laughs> yes, exactly. That is 100% Dude, true. Dude, it's so true. It's so true. I'm, and it's I'm, like... I well, can justify my way out of any box. I promise that. And <clears> I will find the... Qui- yeah. I know I'm, you know, I'm scratching my head making the same look like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can can you talk your way out of stuff too? Yeah, exactly. Just a little bit. Yeah. yeah. A little too smart for too own good. Too smart sometimes. for own good. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. I've been told that. Yeah, once or twice. So then this makes sense. All this stuff yeah. converging, intersecting. Mm. And why Compass Box? Did they approach you? Did you go to them? Nope. Um, well, kind of, kind of, funny circle. Um, so while I was kind of. Um, I was working for Moet Hennessy. Um, I also was um, working some sometimes at Milk and Honey. Um, oh, jeez. Yeah, just terrible places. You I know, I know, I know. It really sucked. Pedigree. Right, it's really tough. Um, I wasn't doing. I wasn't like cocktail bartending there. Bartending yeah. there. I was like hosting, and you know. Still. Um, and uh, I'm not creating. I'm not inventing the next penicillin anytime soon. I promise you. Well, I'll just give it some time. <laughs> um, but uh, I um, was introduced to John Glazer by um, by Sasha Petrasky. And um, John Glazer was just somebody that, at the time, I just knew that he that he was Compass Box, and um, I don't even know if he remembered me or anything like that. But I just remember meeting this guy and saying, "This guy is so passionate about what he does, yeah. um, and it's just so like, it's hard to ignore, isn't it? He's just yeah, he's just uh, there's somebody there's some something about him that's very um, that draws you in as to like why you know why do you do what you do mm-hmm. he's a creative I'm not a creative I'm somebody that I'm an executor I will take like all of your creative ideas punch them up into a little ball and make the numbers work but I don't have all the ideas myself does that Which, make sense absolutely, like I yeah. will kind of like I, so we work together we'll probably conquer whatever yeah exactly because I love the idea part creative, there you go so I'm just so yeah I'm but not, I get I've, that I do. I'm very black and white I've never been the like cre- creative type you know and yeah. so that's what I say like I really am turned on by it I love it and I love analyzing it and figuring out my piece in it. Just like, you know, the Kandinsky, like decoding the Kandinsky and making sense of it. That's making kind of sense my... of the unsensible. Exactly. Yeah. That's me. And so um, so I met John Glazer and, you know, we made uh, he made some joke about, you know, oh, like you, I work because I represented Glenn Morangy at the time. So it's like, oh, you know, one day, one day, maybe, you know, one day, maybe I'll have a sales force like yours. And I was like, John Glazer, if you ever want to have a U.S. sales force, I hope I'm your first call. And... Um, uh, fast forward seven years, I guess. Wow. Yeah, seven years. And um, actually, it was Sasha, again, who um, was like, hey, I heard that, um, I heard that John Glazer's going to gonna develop a U.S. sales team. And I was like, what? And so I called. Um, at the time, I had this recruiter friend who was, I was kind of, at this point, I was working for a different brand. I was working for No Let's Gin. So mm-hmm. a small gin company owned by the Kettle One folks yeah yeah and um at this time and, and i'd been kind of talking to a recruiter because she had had these opportunities that might you know whatever i said do you know anything about this 
Um, and she said, oh, yeah, actually, you'd be perfect for that Compass Box role. What? 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 Come on. Yeah, and it yeah. was just like, the, and, and this was, I don't know, this was so August of 2014. Um, I met John again in September of 2014. Um, and then I, my first day was January 1st of 2015. So we are just on the heels of your third anniversary. Third anniversary. Yep. In fact, when I was in London, I was in London on vacation over Christmas, oh, of course. obviously, because <laughs> where, where else do you go? And when I was in London, John emailed me and said, it's your third anniversary. You know, what, like, like, thank you so much for everything, blah, blah, blah. And I said, um, I said, what does that mean? What's a, is a third anniversary paper? Uh, maybe I'll go buy myself like a, a leather journal, a, a journal or something, you know, because it's my third anniversary. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, go buy, a, go buy yourself a journal on me. And I said, oh, I just Googled it, and it seems like third anniversary is leather. So I'm going to instead <laughs> go to Smithson and buy the really expensive 200-pound leather journal. And he was just like, let's just circle back to that one later. <laughs> but, yeah, he's great. So, yeah, he actually reminded me before I remi remembered. That's amazing. Yeah, so that's kind of the story. And I just – I was always always been just such a big fan of, of his. Um, I need to – you know, when – I hear about certain people immediately. I think I would love to sit down and rack their brain. Yeah, you know, and just say, talk about life. Fascinating. Like this. Yeah. I mean, he's some an American guy who, like, you know, big wine guy who moved to London to work for Johnny Walker because he thought it was going to lead to him to work for wineries. Wow. I mean, and you know, it's 180 who, now. And now he's and now he's you know, when they released the 40 most influential people in the world of Scotch whiskey, there were two people that were alive on that list of 40 people. Oh one is Dr. Bill Lumsden from Glenmorangie, mm -hmm. and the other one is John Glazer. It's amazing. So it's just, you know. It's you're on the, you're like right there. I, you know, it's, it's both me. of those. It's actually me. It's me. See, it's, again. Yeah, I, am, I am the thread here. If you guys I'm aren't being able to paint this yeah, narrative, exactly. you the may be the. butterfly effect is right here. You may be the reason. I, I am, you know. So we've been sipping, and it was funny because, you know, I'm deep in this conversation. is just amazing and very enthralling, mm. if you will. Riveting, I think the word is you were looking for. I believe we like both. <laughs> <laughs> but I took a f first sip of this. Yeah. And I couldn't hear you anymore. I couldn't. I just simply couldn't hear you anymore. It was so moving. The whiskey was oh, so big. Yeah. And I almost went deaf for a second. I was like, fuck. Oh, yeah. Dude, the one so that... what, what are we drinking? Okay, so this, I brought you, and actually I was telling um, our, the person that runs our, our sales down here in Texas, his name is John Carton. Do you know John? I do. Oh, yeah, John Carton. So I was with him, I had a meeting with him earlier, that's why I said I was running late. Gotcha. Um, and he's like, what's that you got in your backpack? And I'm like, oh, it's a bottle of the Lost Blend. He's like, are you kidding me? Why do you have that here? I'm like, oh, I'm going, you know, I said, bring my special bottle out. He's like, but why that one? It's not, it's not any whiskey that we've had for a while. In fact, this whiskey came out right before I started with Compass Box. Okay. Um, and it is, um, it's my, it's my Desert Island whiskey of ours. It is, I have three cases of it um, that I purchased myself at home. Wow. So anytime that was it, I is it, was it a rare thing then? No, I mean it was, it was a pretty large uh, run. It was I think something like eleven thousand bottles. Yeah. Um, but it's the kind of hallmark compass box style, which is this subtly peaty but subtle, also fruity kind of really nice, rich, round, um, nuanced whiskey. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's basically a um, an evolution of uh, a whiskey of ours called Eleuthera. That mm -hmm. was one of the first whiskeys that John made. That was something that you can make with blends that not you can't make from like a single distillery because right. it has peated whiskey and highland malt whiskey. So you have this kind of really beautiful marriage of two different terroirs. So you're getting this nice, um, it's like instead of making a, a champagne with one grape, you're making it with two different grapes. So you right. have a little bit more depth, a little bit more complexity. It's kind of what this whiskey is. So you know what it, what it felt like when I sipped it? So tell, I think you might tell me. Uh, well, we'll see, we'll see now. We'll I don't know if I should even know. talk about it. No, it... You know when there's always there's a guitar riff happening. Okay? Yeah. And so you're getting some drums, you're getting some guitar riffs going, and it's the bottom's not there yet. Okay. The bass is yet to enter the picture. Yes. But you're building this dynamic, you're crescendoing towards mm -hmm. this big moment when the bass comes in. Yep. This when I finished the sip, the bass came in. Yeah. It was the insane. Finish. It's, the dude, finish is bananas. It's crazy and it's like okay now i get it yeah. i got a nice little intro and then that thing explodes yeah at the end what is that what would you say that that's from so well this is i mean that's because we use very old kalila in this whiskey um in that kind of that rich kind of i want to say this it's it's this like fermata 
Yeah. Right? It's like, isn't that the note that's held really long at the end? Right? <laughs> yeah. Is it? Is that okay. Something like that. I probably have to go back to my time. Okay. I was sure, like but... trying to give you a music thing. No, no I, I'm sometimes so, good. So we um, we do a whiskey also that's like this one that's like kind of tur- on crack called Flaming Heart. Mm. And that's actually inspired by a Led Zeppelin lyric. Of course. Of course. Um, and so Flaming Heart is meant to be like a heart that's on fire, something sweet that's also smoking. Yeah. Um, and that one's like a rock and roll whiskey that just explodes in your mouth. So that one kind of knocks you over the head. This one is like a slow burn. It's and massive. And what I man. love about this whiskey is that it's so it almost it sneaks up on you. It's um it's really quaffable. Like it's something that you know I can put an ice cube in this and drink. I I always John Glazer and I aren't aren't allowed to have that whiskey together because we we'll just sit and split the whole bottle and just like talk philosophy. Oh, terrible, terrible I, life. No, you but live. no. I mean, it's just one of those. <laughs> this is one of those whiskeys that you don't just have one glass. Yeah. Like it's like a can of Pringles. No, I know, and I whiskey. kind of am like ah oh, shit. <laughs> there's just like there's about an ounce in here, you know. I was like, God damn it! Well, should, should you I can take have it as slow? much as want, as much as you want. Well, that's that makes me optimistic. There you it go. See, does. yeah. But going to the marketing and the branding of this, it seems like you guys have done some punk rock stuff. Yeah, you know we're what pretty, I mean. We're pretty rock and roll. Edgy. Yeah. Disruptive. Uh, disruptive is uh, we're like the David and Goliath. We're David in the David and Goliath story. We're mm. throwing little rocks at everybody. I mean, we created a whiskey called "This Is Not a Luxury Whiskey" that was three hundred dollars. <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do with that um, besides say it's a rock and roll whiskey? Um, and it appeals to your rebellious nature. Circling back yeah, to that, yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, one of the first things that John said to me when I started working for Compass Box was he was like, "If if I ever see you in a suit, you'll be fired." Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so he wasn't serious, obviously. No, I mean, sure. I, you know, funerals. There's a cause for a suit, but that's the kind of spirit that um, that I can get behind. You know, I, I would. Yeah, that's the kind of guy you can. You definitely can hang out with. Yeah, he's. I mean, and you'll you'll always see him. He looks like he looks like John Malkovich, who's been making whiskey for 200 years. Like he's like undead John Malkovich. Like he's wow. the best. I mean, combination of super cerebral and also you know very clearly knows what what's going on in the whiskey world. Does he have a beard? He does not have a beard. Okay, so just the Malkovich minus beard. Because Malkovich kind of... Oh, yeah, I guess he's a little beardy. No, but um, I like that because it gives you this kind of austerity in a way. Yeah, he's... Uh, yeah. Some people have said he's also could be like Doogie Hauser, who's been making whiskey for... Interesting. ...for 200 years. I don't know. It's up in the air. We'll have to ask him. I like I, to yeah, have like, him self-identify. No, that's good. It's better than mm. being judged by you and I probably just randomly in Randomly, tone. yeah. Well, over a glass of whiskey, you know. <laughs> but this is how it goes. But this is how it goes, right? It's you don't get to pick your battle, right? No, you really your battle don't. Just comes. Your battle just comes. And that's you're, always... You're there to fight it or you're not. Um, well, so this is a lovely whiskey. What it... Thank you. 100% just, blended malt, so 100% malt whiskeys. Um, it's actually three single malt whiskeys blended together. Man. Mm-hmm. Um, two... Uh, Two different years of Klein Leash, one year of Kalila, and a little bit of Altaben. So you like it because here's the cool thing about what you guys are doing that yeah. I've ascertained here in the past 38 minutes. 38 minutes. That's right. Time so what? you like the on and the off decoding things. Mm. If you worked for a Scotch brand that wouldn't tell you what went into it, oh yeah, no, pull your no hair chance. out. Yeah. So I love how modular yeah. this whiskey is, at least in a way from an education perspective. Absolutely. It's like block, 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 probably these proportions. You probably get all of the details. You know, I, I'm a sponge for this kind of stuff. Like yeah. if it's, um, you know, I don't know. Again, I'm not part of the creative process. I won't like, I'll, I'll taste stuff and be like, tastes like cheese. And, <laughs> and you know, I'll go back to the computer, go back to the abacus over there. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it, it, what we are doing is that John, it's, so many people are kind of like poo pooing on blends. Yeah. But the thing about, the thing about blending companies versus, you know, single malt companies is that, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge to blend different whiskeys from the same distillery together. Absolutely. Right. It's even more of a challenge to blend whiskeys together from different distilleries and make yeah. it taste make it taste harmonious. Um, and Super I think groups never work for yeah, that exact reason. Exactly. They're bold personalities from different exactly. backgrounds. Exactly. So this is so John, the fact that John's able to make like he's the what is the guy that created all the um, what's the, the the Beatles guy that the created the Beatles? Sir George Martin. Exactly. He is the George Martin yeah. of Scotch whiskey. Oh, that's that's oh. brilliant. Boom. So I, I get think, it. Well, we're going to just, we just go meet I this I think we guy. just nailed it right there. So George, oh, my God. That's fucking epic. I think that's Very excellent. Brilliant. Well, good. If that if that is not cause for people to want to drink Compass Box, I don't know. But it's not to mention the artworks. The artworks like, great. We have a um, we have a company named uh, Stranger and Stranger that does our um, does our bottles and their labels, and they're just brilliant. Um, and sometimes we give them, you know, really short briefs. Like, imagine you're sitting under a spice tree tripping on acid. 
and then that's how we got the label for Spice Tree. So. Amazing. <laughs> yep. Not a bad brief. Well, so I've got <laughs> two questions left for you before you are off into the night mm. to so both calculate numbers and sip some whiskey, I imagine, in uh, equal both, parts. Both things. So the first is, how do you like, okay, because numbers people, right? So mm. I work with a lot of coders. Oh, yeah. I would never put My a people. coder in front of an audience of very discerning and somewhat pretentious <laughs> whiskey drinkers. Right. However, mm. you're out there every day fighting the good fight, mm-hmm. doing the education out there in the public. Does it come natural to you? Um, it actually kind of goes back to the radio stuff. So uh-huh. when I was in college, I used to work a lot at a radio station. And you can you please like- do the call letters? <laughs> do, can you, I'm sure you, I I know for sure you know it. Muscle memory. Yes, I do. Uh, from the classics to the cutting edge, this is the rock station. I See, rock. I'm clapping <laughs> just a little bit. Perfect. You made me blush. <laughs> um, it's something that you learn how to kind of how to perform and how to put that put that confidence out there. Right. Um, but also when. When I when you learn about something and you are really passionate about all of the time and effort and um, details and attention and fanaticism that goes into it, yeah. um, I think even people like like weird nerdy Cody people like me like to just share that. Yeah. So I mean, if I didn't know everything about all the whiskeys, or if I was if I just was kind of going and spouting off marketing information, which I'm is if you ask anyone who knows me or has seen me speak, it's not my forte is not going by the party lines like yeah. you know i cuss a lot i you know kind of make weird parallels but Good. again for me it's about making making this stuff accessible sure. and even to the most pretentious people you know it's saying hey um this is you know like doesn't this taste like circus peanuts you know those candy the of circus course pe- I that's do. Like, the orange ones we just beautiful. yeah we just created this whiskey called phenomenology where we didn't give any tasting notes and my immediate tasting note on it was circus peanut candy and people were like i get that you I know, use Skittles all the time as a yeah, taste. I love yeah. Um, as a weird aside, I always say like, oh my God, this whiskey is bananas. And I always say that oh, it's just so, oh, it's bananas. Because will of be the like, esters? No, no, no. I just say, I just say it's nuts. <laughs> like this has been, oh, it's so good. It's bananas. That's or, your it's food crazy. <laughs> no, but I just say like, instead of saying that's crazy, yeah, I yeah, say yeah. bananas. And no, no joke. Like at least one, one person in every tasting is like, I get banana. <laughs> I totally I get banana out of it. I'm like, no, it's a really peated whiskey that's like 75% art bag. Like, no, there's no banana. No, it's in there. Mm. But if you, t- if you smelling Teach is their, believing. Yes. Yeah. Well, and if they trust you, I know, your word right? is gospel to them. But yeah, so I mean, I guess it's, if I had to go up there and present something that I didn't really have a big hand in mm. um, or belief in or um, kind of passion about, then yeah. But um it's it's uh it's exciting it's exciting to get to share this kind of stuff with people and a lot of people don't know about it and we're kind of a small culty brand yeah so um, i love that part of it yeah it's like people buy it because those you guys put out a new seven inch yeah you know, i mean they're like hoarding <laughs> yeah. these yeah. releases people are like exactly it's exactly so cool. before they've even tasted it yeah. so i mean i'm lucky that we make great whiskey but you know people are like oh can when can i order them like you don't even know what's in it doesn't matter <laughs> you don't even Sign taste it up. yet singles of the sight month club. Sight, exactly yeah. sight unseen so i love that um, well, so the last question then for you uh, normally i make it a little bit broader than this i'm gonna make it kind of specific because we both love london we both love music mm. so you're sipping this exact scotch anywhere in the mm. world uh, but not in san antonio because obviously we're, we're, this is an amazing moment this is yours and mine right now yeah. anywhere else though globally and you can have a conversation and a sip with any brit living mm. or deceased who would you love to just sit next to and have a conversation and sip scotch with oh my god um, this is not a one or zero answer, probably. This is either. not a one. This is so now I can't make eye contact because I gotta look. To, <laughs> I gotta do the weird. Okay. Um, uh, Gilbert and George. It's I'm this not familiar. It's art. Me. It's this art. These uh, this this photography duo artists. Um, that have always their work has always spoken to me, and I think that they'd really get a kick out of the whiskeys. Um, and they have this uh, they have this this piece called Red Morning, which always to me is screamed out for one of our whiskeys. That's the best I can come up with on the, on such a short notice. No, that's good. But I think that the, yeah, this I've always found that that I want to like pick the brain of these of of living artists. Yeah. you know what I mean. That I that their work really really speaks to me. Um, 
part of part of me feels that it's like it's kind of like spoiling the spoiling the surprise or spoiling it is the secret removing, yeah. because you know when you like listen to a song and you really like it and you want to know what all the lyrics are and then you look up the lyrics and then once you know the lyrics there's kind of that mystery is gone <laughs> there is one cautionary tale yeah I, we both love music there was a particular artist his name is David Bazan he plays in Pidge of the Lion he's a oh, yeah. really good, really great guy um, and I got to talk to him a little bit but I asked him I said how do you understand how profound your lyrics are in just as few words as possible and he goes man I don't know I just do what I do <laughs> and, like, like, oh. and your heart just breaks into little well it's even pieces. more profound because yeah. it's so simple it's just in the nature of the lyrics themselves so yeah. maybe a cautionary tale but yeah. leave your you know leave your artist to be flawed yeah. As men. Exactly. And women, but make wonderful art. Yeah. There's something, I don't know, there's something about, there's something about when, you know, you see, when you see someone manipulate a photograph in such a way that, that you don't know why it jars you and yeah. you kind of stare at it and stare at it and you kind of want someone to explain, crack it for you again. Yeah. Crack the code. Decoding it. Everything's What's been brilliant uh, chatting for Gosh, just over 45 minutes. Oh, my goodness. I know. I don't ever do time things, but I figure since you're a DJ, you probably want to have these meters and the marks. Yeah, and stuff. obviously, yeah. <laughs> I know. Yep. And I don't know what you're in store for here in San Antonio the rest of the week. I the am. Um, tomorrow morning, I'm giving a seminar on scotch cocktails. Uh-huh. Um, actually, my, my neonatologist older brother, who happens to be a scotch nerd as well, is going to be a guest speaker in my Amazing. So it will be the Agalka, the Agalka siblings. Oh, sorry, Racket. Racket, Agalka the Agalka racket. racket, right? Exactly, the Agalka racket. Um, I like that. I'm going to use that. Anyway. <laughs> you can use that tomorrow. I'll give you a little shout Please. out. Oh, yeah, that's great. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about Scotch co- Scotch cocktails. Um, we just debuted some new limited editions here. Our phenomenology and no name, mm. um, which is the whiskey so peated d- needs no name. Wow, um, sounds like a cowboy. The Darth Darth Vader of Scotch whiskey, as I like to, <laughs> as I like to say it. My uh, my good friend Scotch Trooper. Have you met Scotch Trooper? No, before? but we're familiar. Oh yeah. my God, he's one of the best people on the planet. I gotta meet him. I He's keep so hearing great. about it. He's yeah. really great. Um, but he he was in New York last uh, when we launched it in November, and I was like, "Listen, buddy, we're releasing a whiskey that's got your name all over it." He's like, "What are you talking about?" I'm like, "It's called, it's the Darth Vader of Scotch whiskey." And I showed him a picture, and he's oh like, my "Oh my god, <laughs> it's amazing!" Just like little girl gr- glee over the phone line, right? That's how it goes. Yeah. Well, I think it's gonna be a great presentation. It's Thank great you, you get to bring the family into it. It's great to Thank sip you. some scotch with you Absolutely. and persistence and tenacity. <sighs> Finally, I know. Finally, pay it pays off. off. And it's honestly, good. it's better. To, better. I'm in a much more relaxed state than I was when we were in Austin. Perfect. So this is great. I was running around, flying everywhere. See, I mean, this pose is very natural. I yeah. You glass know, of scotch and like this scotch, leather chair. I got, I got all. This, the, I'll bring you a, a cigarette in just a second. Exactly. The a hotel room upstairs. You got me. You got me at my best. Today. You are completely set. I yeah. really appreciate you taking the time to. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. It's been my fellow pleasure. Aquarians unite as Absolutely. I do the Jed Nelson. Thank I love you so it. much. Cheers. Well, there we have it, the beautiful Karen Egalka of Compass Box Whiskey. Aquarians unite. You know, we're thick as thieves instantly dove into conversation, talking about life, talking about loss, talking about everything in between. And life is an interesting thing, a difficult thing, a beautiful thing. And honestly, reflecting and diving into those details and recanting those beautiful memories of the past over a beautiful glass of Compass Box Whiskey, there is no finer way to spend an hour with someone so thank you so much karen hope to see you soon in san antonio austin and everywhere in between so thanks everybody for listening to show to v with mike g no matter how many episodes of master chef you watch and you're still wondering what the hell the format of the show is or if you're really looking forward to castle rock stephen king jj abrams combining on a show yeah all right i'll watch that please keep dancing <laughs>